Yo, what's going on guys? Arax here, welcome back to another Destiny 2 video and welcome to my complete guide for the new Leviathan Raid Lair, the Eater of Worlds. My raid team and I have just completed it and I'm gonna say I really enjoyed this raid. For me, it's definitely without a doubt my highlight of the entire Curse of Osiris DLC. It's shorter than a conventional raid with only one main boss encounter and a couple of smaller encounters but it was still well paced. The raid environment was varied and interesting and all up, it was just a lot of fun to play. So it's definitely something I'll be jumping back into again very soon. However, that aside, you're here for the guide and not my rambling. So let's turn our attention to the important stuff. Of course, if you do enjoy this video and you do find it helpful, then a like would be super appreciated and be sure to comment down below if you have any questions. So. To begin with, you load into the Leviathan Raid once again, only this time you enter through the door in front of you and you work your way through a number of corridors, jump through what looks like an engine room and get flung through a pretty epic gravity waterfall thing. In truth, I don't really know what it is, but eventually you'll end up here in this mysterious purple looking room. This is your first trial. Essentially, what lies ahead of you is a big expanse of water and loads of platforms that need to be crossed in order to get your first actual encounter. But the process of crossing this lake, so to speak, will require a bit of communication. In front of you is a platform. If you jump on this, another will spawn. However, if two or more people stand on the same platform, then it will sink into the water and you'll die. So in order to cross this, I'd recommend assigning numbers to your team, one through six, and then that will be the order in which you move across the platforms. For example, in the first instance, I jump on the platform to begin with, a second one spawns, I jump on platform number two, and then player number two jumps on the platform I just left. The next platform spawns, I move forward one, as does player two, and then player three jumps on the first platform. You repeat this process, gradually working your way along the platforms, ensuring you are following one another, and each of you staying on a platform as you move forward. Do this correctly, and you'll eventually get close enough to an island with some enemies on that. Jump up here, clear the enemies, and this is basically your first checkpoint in the lake. Anytime you get to one of these, if you fail the next section, you won't have to go back to the very beginning, you can instead continue from here. You'll need to repeat this process a further three times before you finally get to the end, and it gets a little more complicated each time, but the principle still remains the same. At all times, you're crossing the platforms as a team, each person only standing on one plate, and the whole team moves forward, a plate each time. The second instance will have you split into two teams of three since the path forks, so three go left, advancing forward, three go right. The third instance will have you backtrack and reverse the order when you get a certain way through, but the principle still remains the same. Platformers won't always spawn in front of you, sometimes they'll be to the side, but provided you follow your numbers and communicate when you're jumping, you'll cross it fine. A couple of things worth calling out, the people at the back, their platforms will go red. This is a sign that it's going to sink, but you still have about 10 seconds to stand on the platform before it begins moving. So, you don't need to panic, it just means that in times like this, you'll need to move a little more quickly as a team, but this is just a mechanic to keep you moving. All up, it's pretty easy once you get it, it's just going to require some communication, especially during the fourth and final phase. However, once you complete the final leg, it'll see you jump up onto dry land, and this is where your first encounter is. This isn't really a challenging encounter, to be honest, it's essentially a horde mode style battle. Enemy Cabal will fly in on dropships and you just need to survive the waves. Split your team into two teams of three, three cover the left, three cover the right, and just fight until it's over. You'll encounter marauders, incinerators, and in the end, the ones that fire the rockets too, so it can get a little bit hectic, but ultimately, you're just fighting standard Cabal enemies. Clear these out and the floor behind you will open up, plus a chest will spawn in front, so open that up, grab your loot, dive down and move on to the next stage. On the way to the next encounter, you'll run through this engine room with these arc pulses. Anytime the pistons move left, a shockwave will be sent out that'll kill anyone standing in the open. The safe spaces are the areas with these small rubber squares on the ground behind these little walls. Stand on these to survive the pulses and keep moving forwards. After that, you'll then get sucked through what I can only assume is the Leviathan's digestive system and you'll end up here. This is the room where you'll fight the final boss, but before you get to that, you have the pre-boss encounter to get through. But since both encounters take place in the same room, this is the perfect time to learn the lay of the land. In the center is this big rocky looking mass with lots of circular shaped craters in it. This is where the mines are going to spawn and I'll speak more about them in just a moment. Then located around the room in the three corners, if you will, are these three platforms with these flaming altars. There's a void one, a solar one, and an arc one. In addition to that, dotted around the room are these cannons called Vex Craniums. There are six located around the room, typically two in between each plate. So two between void and solar, 
two between Solar and Arc, and two between Arc and Void. These cannons need to be charged in order to use them, so you pick them up and you place them in the flaming altars on the plates, and they'll then charge with the respective elements. The charging process takes a little bit of time, but you'll know when it's done since the flaming pillar will go away and the gun will be left floating. But why is this all important, you ask? Well, now that you understand the room and the mechanics, let's talk about the fight. See, when you pick up your first Vex Cranium, a series of mines will spawn in the circular craters in that rocky mass in the center. And the only way to destroy these is with the lasers fired from the Vex cannons. Void lasers kill void mines, arc kill arc, and solar kill solar. Typically, you'll focus on one side at a time, but the idea is that you charge the cannons and use them to destroy all the mines before they detonate. And when you've done that on one side, it'll disintegrate to leave behind the Vex shield, and you'll then move on to the other side and repeat the process. So, for this, you want to split your team into three teams of two. At each plate, you have one person whose job it is to deal with the adds, meanwhile the other person is in charge of getting the cannons and charging them. Remember that there are six cannons, and each plate has three flaming altars, so you can charge multiple at one time. Our team refer to the act of charging cannons as cooking the cannons, so for callout purposes I'd be like, I'm cooking void, I'm cooking solar, or arc is cooked, etc. With your team assigned, you'll work out which side is the focus to begin with, and you'll call out the mines you see. For example, it could be to void to arc. With this information, the cannon runners go around and grab the cannons, and put them in the flames to begin cooking them in the respective areas. Meanwhile, the others keep the adds under control. When the cannons are ready, you grab them, run to the side where the mines are, and zap them with the laser. Now, a cannon has a limited ammo supply. You have enough ammo to take out one and a half mines. So if there are, say, two void on one side, and you use void, then you have enough to completely destroy one and take the other to half health, allowing someone else to finish it off, or for you to go back and grab another cannon, and then make it easier to finish off. Keep in mind that these mines will detonate if you take too long, so don't just get hyper-focused on a single target. If you know there are two or three of one element, make sure the cannons are cooking before you head out to zap them, so that way once the gun is used, you can then return and grab the next one. Also make sure you use the cannons until they are empty, since that is when they despawn, and then the new ones will of course respawn. Either way, you want to communicate with your team, calling out which mines and which elements have spawned in which locations, rotating around to zap them with the appropriate lasers, and any time all mines on a single side are dealt with, that side will disappear, revealing what's inside. If you repeat this for all three sides, you will complete the encounter. This whole process was essentially to remove the outer shell for the boss, because now, now it's boss time. Now the boss fight itself makes use of the very same mechanic you just used for the previous fight. It too hinges on using the plates and the Vex Cranium Cannons to fire lasers, only their application is a little different. But since you already know the layout of the room, we can get right into the actual boss mechanics. I'll go over those first, and then I'll walk you through how the fight actually plays out. In the centre of the room is the boss, this big Vex dude called Argos. No, not the UK shopping chain, he's actually a Vex guy. He has a shield around him, and the only way to deal damage to him is to drop this shield. But in order to do this, you're going to need to communicate. See, around the outside of the shield are these three cylinders, and then on one side, there will also be three elemental orbs. The side that is the focus for any given round will glow like this. This is what we call the active side. The orbs surrounding the cylinder need to be pushed into the center at the same time, and in doing so, you will drop the shield. If you fire a corresponding laser at these orbs, they move, all while you are keeping the laser beam on them. So you're essentially guiding the orb into the center. But you have to use the matching elements. This is going to once again involve cooking the appropriate cannon. Once this is done and the shield drops, you have a window to do damage, so you fire at the boss's head. However, during this time, there are a couple more things to watch out for. Firstly, this triangular looking net that he fires towards you, if you get caught by this, it'll send you flying up into the sky and your team will need to shoot it in order to set you free. It's very obvious though, so it's very easy to dodge and realistically, you shouldn't be getting hit by this. On top of that, during the damage phase, these harpy looking things spawn with these tails. They look sort of like those machines in the Matrix. These will dive bomb one of the players and explode, so you want to shoot them before that happens. Finally, once the damage phase is done and the shield goes back up, there's one more thing to factor in. There'll be a phase where the shield drops again and these platforms appear. This is the point where the boss is trying to wipe you and your team, and in order to prevent this, you need to destroy two of the weak spots on it. So for this, you'll jump up onto the platforms to get closer and shoot them. There are six weak spots, two on his head, left and right, two on his back, left and right, and two on his arms, again left and right. They're these bright glowing white spots. But here's the important thing. These functions sort of like how Crota's shield used to in the dark below. The focus on these isn't as much the damage as it is the sustained fire. 
Using things like rockets on these is actually a waste of time. What you want to do is maintain fire on them at all times. The more you shoot, the more it goes red, and if you stop shooting, it goes back to being white. So the best way to tackle these is to split the team into two teams of three, and then team shot them so that someone is always firing. Use primaries or secondaries, and if you shoot them enough, they will explode. You need to destroy two weak spots to make the boss flinch and stop it from wiping the team. So you normally want to coordinate these weak spots. We start with the arms since they are the most tricky because he moves around sometimes. Then during the next phase we do the head because it requires a bit of climbing and then for the final phase we do the back because it's the easiest. This does of course mean you have to do the boss fight in four damage rotations or less. If it takes you more than that since you have used the three flinches, well you're dead. But once you make him flinch, you'll jump off the platforms, back to the land, and then repeat the process. So, those are the boss mechanics, but how does the actual fight play out? Well, to begin with, you start the encounter by picking up one of the Vex cannons, and then when the bottom corner of the screen says Argos begins energy collection, it means he's choosing a side. Look for the glowing cylinder to determine the active side, and at this point, three of your team should group up here. These are your defenders. Their job is to control the ads. Since this is the active platform, they don't need to worry about the other two locations, they can simply stay here and control the ads. Meanwhile, the other three are the cannon cookers. Firstly, you look up to see what element orbs there are. They can be any configuration. Sometimes it's all of the same, sometimes it's one of each, sometimes it's two of one, one of another. Call them out, and then between the cannon team, you need to go and start cooking the cannons. Now remember, there are six, so what you want to do is reserve three for the orbs, and then cook the other three on the active platform, since these can also be used during the DPS phase for additional boss damage. I can't stress enough how important it is to make sure you have heavy ammo during this phase. Sins of the Past is one of the best rocket launchers you can use, it's the raid rocket launcher and it does a lot of damage. Minotaurs will spawn during the ad waves and provided you put some bullets into them or some damage into them, they reliably drop heavy ammo bricks so you can use them to stock up whenever you need. They spawn quite frequently and you'll normally be able to get at least say 4 or 5 blocks during a rotation. When the cannons are cooked, the cannon team grab the respective elements and return to the active platform. They look up, count down together, 3, 2, 1, and at the same time guide their orbs into the middle. Do this correctly and the shield will go down. You'll also have a tiny bit of ammo left in your cannon, so once the shield drops you can fire that into the boss's face for some additional damage. Be sure to keep your eyes peeled for the triangle prism, dodge this so you don't get trapped, and then unload all your rockets, use your supers, fire everything you have. Ideally, you want to be aiming to do around a third of his health each time, maybe a tiny bit less, but that way you can get this done in 3 to 4 rotations, 4 of course being the max. During the damage phase, watch out for the matrix-like machines that spawn, we call them eyes for call-out purposes, when they pop up someone will shout shoot the eyes, they go down quickly to take care of them, and return to doing damage. Once the shield goes back up, group up, make sure you know your teams, we typically use the teams that we do for the encounter, so cannon team and defense team. After a few seconds, the shield will drop and those platforms will spawn. Move with your team, being careful where you jump, and team shoot one of the weak spots. Again, I'd suggest working on matching pairs, so arms first, since they are the hardest and you don't want to leave them till the end. Take out both of them, interrupt him, jump off the platforms, back to land, and now, now you repeat the process again. Check for the active platform, call out the elemental orbs, cook the cannons, deal the damage, watching out for the traps and the enemies, and interrupt him again. Remember, you only have three potential interrupts, so you need to have them killed on the fourth phase. Otherwise, it's game over. But repeat this process the third time, dish out enough damage, and that's it. There's no cheap end of the boss mechanic, like with, say, Kalos or Oryx, where he just tried to kill you on, like, one HP. When this guy's dead, he's dead. So once that's finished, you then get sucked back into Kalos' treasure room, where you can collect your loot, and that is the raid finished. However, to circle back for a moment on the final boss fight, a few weapon recommendations. Again, Sins of the Past is an incredibly powerful rocket launcher, and pretty much our entire team ran with this. In addition to that, Cold Heart is great for the interrupt phase since it's good for sustained damage, and seemed to be a little bit more effective than the Prometheus Lens, despite its kind of bugged nature, so I strongly suggest bringing Cold Heart with you as your exotic. But that's pretty much it, it might sound like a lot, but really once you get the rotation down, the final boss isn't actually too bad, there's a lot going on, but everyone has their role and if they do it properly, you should be fine. Hopefully this was helpful to you guys, if you have any questions, by all means let me know in the comments down below, but otherwise thank you for watching, take it easy, catch you next time, peace out.